So we are live on YouTube for Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We're going to be talking this morning with um, Megan from the Duke Lemur Center in Durham, North Carolina. And we're going to learn a little bit about these primates and who they are, what they are, and a little bit more. So we're just getting started. Thank you all for joining us today and Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants for a classroom expedition visit out into the Duke Lemur Center. So again, hi everyone and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Wes Delavola and I'll be your host for today. We have, re we have really exciting virtual field trip planned for today to the Duke Lemur Center in Durham, North Carolina. And today we're going to meet someone, some of, uh, sorry, some of the lemur species who call the forests around the center home. Joining us today is Megan McGrath, Education Programs Manager at the center. So good morning, Megan. Hi, good morning. And I'm actually gonna flip my view really quick so you guys can see the thing that I know you're here to see. Which there is, of course, the lemurs. We're actually going to start with moving because we've got Grace in here to feed these guys for the day. She's got their breakfast, and as you can see, they're excited about it. So we're going to head out to their feeding site in the forest. We'll follow behind, and you guys can see them. And then once we get settled, I'll talk a little more about them. So you'll get kind of a virtual well, tour here. That's right, amazing. Well, Megan, I'm going to turn everything over to you. I've got you pinned to the top. So we're going to follow your adventures with the lemurs, and I'll let you do your thing for, for a little while and show us and tell us more about the lemurs. Great. So we've got three species who live out here. I'm following behind. As you can see, they're following nicely behind Grayson. And we've got uh, blue-eyed black lemurs out here, ring-tailed lemurs, and cockerel shafak. Um, so ring-tailed lemurs, I like to call the poster child for lemurs. Everybody knows a ring-tailed lemur. But what most people don't realize is that there's about 100 species of lemur. Uh, most of them you don't see in zoos or other places. So you can see that some of them are taking their time getting over to the feeding site. And right behind me, we have our cockerel shafak. These guys are really amazing to watch since as you can see, they bounce on their hind legs instead of running on all fours. And I think my video gets a little choppy as I walk, but I promise I'll be stopping so that we can see everybody a little more clearly. I hope you can see Lupicina bouncing in front of us. She got ahead of me. All right, so we are now in our feeding area. So the lemurs should be a little bit more settled so I can introduce them. So this is Lupicina. She's the female cockerel shafak. And she lives with a male named Gabe. His name's actually Elagabalus, but that's a bit of a mouthful. So we just call him Gabe. He's over there in the woods about to bounce over. So cockerel shafak are really unique lemurs in that they are bipedal like us, bipedal meaning two-footed. They walk on two legs like we do. Um, except instead of walking, they bounce sideways. Their hips are rotated out so it's more comfortable for them to leap. And as you can see, Gabe here leaps and then latches onto facing the tree. And now he's digging into his breakfast. He's going for his favorite foods first. Usually that's carrot or sweet potato, but they're also huge fans of peanuts. And then over here, we have Lila and Aristides. So Lila is on the right and Aristides is on the left and they're eating their breakfast too, but you'll notice it looks a little different. So we have different types of food for the different kinds of lemur. We call this lemur chow. It's a special type of primate food for old world primates that it has everything that they need in their diet. Um, and so they're chowing down on their breakfast. And then our last group is actually in a separate area. This is one of our self-contained areas we have out in the forest. It's a separate habitat we can use because our blue-eyed black lemurs who are hanging out inside of here, here you can see Quinn right here, that's dad. These guys can be a little intense about their food. They are a bit food aggressive, especially because mom, who we can't see right now, but I will introduce you in just a little while. Mom is in the back area and she has a brand new baby who's just over a month old named Brady. So she's a little hangry right now. So she stays inside of the area while she eats breakfast so that everybody else has a chance to eat their breakfast. And then she'll come out a little bit later. So 
we'll spend more time with Gabe here. Gabe is actually another lemur that was born here at the lemur center. And the easy way that I tell him and Lupicina apart is that Gabe does not have a collar on. Lupi, Lupicina, actually has a collar. I'll show you her over here. She has a collar that we can use to, oops, sun glare, hold on. Let me get that out of your face. All right, so she has a collar that we can use to help as a radio tracker because on really rainy mornings here at the Duke Lemur Center, the lemurs don't want to come down from that nice space up in the tree that they've huddled into and gotten nice and warm and snug. And so sometimes they don't come down for breakfast when Grayson brings it out. And so she can actually, um, Grayson can come out here and use a radio tracker to see where up in the trees they're hanging out to make sure that everything's okay and they're just snuggled up because it's rainy. Now, what you just saw is a really great behavior. You saw some displacement. So displacement means that Loopy, who is now right over there eating, just moved Gabe away from his food bowl. Gabe has now switched places with her. That's because in lemur families, girls are in charge. So Lupicina got all of the food she wanted out of her bowl, and then she hopped right over to where Gabe was eating out of his bowl, and he immediately hopped away because he knows she's in charge, so she gets to dig all the food out of there next. Don't worry, Gabe ate all of his favorites really, really quick. He still gets them, but girls are in charge, so they got all the food they want. Let me see if I can show you a little bit of their food up here. Loopy usually doesn't care if I put the camera near her. So, cockerel Shafak have a very special diet. I showed you earlier that the ring-tailed lemurs are just eating a kind of a lemur biscuit. Well, cockerel Shafak actually have five different types of vegetables. They get greens. They get a special type of primate food called polivore chow. Polivore meaning leaf eater because cockerel shafak are a type of lemur that eats mostly leaves. And that's really unusual. Usually animals this size eat fruits and vegetables and berries and nuts. They're not gonna eat mostly leaves because it's really hard to get all the energy you need from leaves. And so they're very, very unique animals and they have very, very sensitive digestive systems. So whereas everybody else can kind of get their lemur chow for the day and be okay, these guys always have to get a whole complete diet every single day but they also love to eat everything around them in the forest. So let me see if I can find some of their favorites around me. Yep, right here, if we go down, this is a grapevine that's native to North Carolina. It grows all around the forest and they love to munch on those leaves and maybe even the grapes. We also have sweet gum, um, tulip poplar, all kinds of trees out here that the lemurs love. They love the new red bud flowers, those pink flowers that come out first thing in the spring. They love eating those. So they can also snack all around the forest. We've got mulberries here in North Carolina. We've got other berry bushes and trees. So they may get a specially made diet for them from Grayson every day, but they also tend to just eat whatever they want in the forest too. Well, I think we have a little bit of time before our family gets let out. So if anybody has any questions, I think maybe we could take a question break really quick and then I can introduce you to mom, dad, and baby. That's great. If anyone has any questions, raise your hand and we can uh, throw out some questions if anyone has them. It doesn't look like we have any yet on the YouTube comments, but if anyone here has questions, you can either write them in the comments or raise your hand. Uh, and I'll go ahead and pick on you if anyone has any questions. If not, I might have some questions. <laughs> I can also just keep talking about lemurs pretty much all day, so that's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're all really definitely enjoying that. Um, <laughs> I do have a quite I have one quick question. I don't know if maybe you'll get to it later, but the rings on their tails, what are, what's the, do we know why they have the rings on their tails? So we have a couple of best guesses, um, as is often the case when you're learning about animal adaptations. Um, we, we weren't there when they evolved. We weren't, there was no decision made. It was just a process of evolution and selection. So we think that the best reason for the black and white rings on the ring tail is they actually act as a sort of camouflage and also a signal marker between the troop. So ring-tailed lemurs are the most terrestrial of all of the lemur species. They spend about half of their time on the ground which is pretty unusual. Other lemurs like the cockerel shafak we met earlier, they spend most of their time in the mid-level of the forest and they in the wild usually don't come down to the ground almost ever. 
And so ring-tailed lemurs are very unusual. They live in the spiny desert region, which is about as hospitable as it sounds in the southern part of Madagascar. And so they spend a lot of time on the ground. There's dry grasslands, there's tough trees and spines all around them. So as they're moving on the ground, they will walk with their tail kind of held up like a little question mark. It kind of curves at the top. And when you see the whole troop of ring tails walk around, you'll notice that they all have their tails up as they're walking. And usually when mom gets up, because she's in charge, and her tail is up and curled around and starts moving, everybody else looks and sees mom start moving and they start following her wherever she's going so they can see each other. But you'd be amazed how well that tail blends in. I actually have helped sometimes when we're looking for lemurs out in the treetops when it's a rainy day and we want to make sure they're okay. And it's really, really hard to see those striped tails because it's a type of disruptive camouflage. So basically with disruptive camouflage, with spots or stripes or things like that, instead of me seeing a long black line, like if it were just a long black tail, I can't quite see, is that a tail or is that the light and shadow kind of moving through the forest? If you don't have one big outline, you can't really tell. A great example of that would be tigers moving around in trees. So tigers have orange and black stripes, but the trees in India and other parts of Asia aren't orange and black stripes. So that's not why they're camouflaged. They're camouflaged so that you don't see one giant orange thing moving through the trees. You see, oh, the light's moving a little bit. Maybe that leaf is moving over there, but you can't quite see the animal. And so that's the kind of thing that the tail can do for the ring-tailed lemur. Oh, Aristides has decided to venture. He might be going over to steal some food from the cockerel shafak. As I mentioned earlier, the ring-tails get just their chow, whereas the cockerel shafak get all the tasty veggies. So sometimes there's a little bit of food thievery that happens. And so look, checking to make sure if we've got any other questions. I haven't seen a hand up yet. I'm going to check with the, the YouTube and see if we've got anything in comments. Oh, uh, we've got a question um, from Connor. Um, how, uh, actually got quite a few questions. They're great. They're coming in. Um, <laughs> so uh, we've got a few. We've got uh, one from Connor. How does the mom provide for her children? That's a great question. So as primates, lemurs spend a lot of time with their mom. That's one of the characteristics of us primates is that we're very needy as babies. We spend a long time with mom. Um, other animals spend maybe a few weeks to a few months, whereas we usually spend years, and in humans' cases, sometimes a few too many years living at home with mom and dad. Lemurs provide for their babies in a couple of different ways. Now, as mammals, they will produce milk, and babies will um, use milk as their primary source of food when they are first born, but lemurs live up in the trees. So how does a baby manage to stick around when lemurs are moving through the trees? So the main way that most lemurs do this is that when they have a baby, the babies are called clingers. So the babies will cling to mom as soon as they're born, they come right out of the birth canal and crawl right up and they cling really tightly and they nestle in really close. And we're gonna see an example of that in just a little bit, actually, I can show you. And they look, I like to say they look a little bit like a fanny pack. They actually ride with their fingers tucked in right around mom's hip and then their feet tucked in and their toes grabbing around the other hip. And then you see a little face poking out from the side. You'll see it in a moment. It's just so cute. And their tail wraps around and it really does look like a little fanny pack. And then as they get older, a lot of the lemurs will start riding around on mom's back. In the cockerel shafak that are in front of us as Gabe was growing up and Lupicino were growing up, they actually rode around on mom's back like a backpack. Um, so they're still clinging to mom. They'll sometimes even get rides from the other members of their family because primates are social animals mostly. Um, but they will um, slowly start hopping on and off, grabbing food from mom, tasting what she's eating. And then eventually they'll start getting more solo in their adventures. They'll start getting a little more independent. Um, but moms are very much in charge. And we think the reason for that is that in the lemurs, mom is the one having the baby. She needs all the best food. She needs access to all the safest places. When they sleep at night, mom's the one huddled up in the middle and everyone huddles around her to keep her warm and safe. And so that means that babies are gonna be safe. Babies are gonna get the best access to food. So when you see female dominated animals, that's why we think that they are working that way and evolved that way. That is super interesting to think about how the community works together to take care of the mom and of course her babies. And so it's good for the entire community. So I have a do, we have got a couple questions that have come in and one that seems to get a lot of, uh, that's been asked quite a few times is, how big are the lemurs and how much do they weigh and how long do they live? That seems to be 
question we've gotten a lot and I know we've got some other questions from Stafford sure. Springs so I'll send those over once we find out how big they are and how long they live. Sure so those are actually really big questions we get all the time and they're also really big questions because as I mentioned there's a hundred different species of lemur so if we're talking about the smallest primate in the world which is Madame Bertha's mouse lemur that is a lemur that is about two inches tall and weighs only I don't know a few grams they're very very tiny um, but if we're talking about the largest lemur, which lives in Madagascar, that's the Indri. Indri move around a lot like our Shafak here do. They're on their hind legs and they stand about three feet tall. If you were to stretch them all the way out with their legs and their arms, they'd be about four feet in length. So those lemurs obviously weigh quite a bit more. Our cockerel Shafak right here, I'm actually going to get an assist from Grayson to see if she can help me out with how much they weigh usually. I want to say somewhere around like three to 4,000 grams, three to four kilograms. Um, we use kilograms. I'm not good at converting. So hopefully everybody, <laughs> hopefully most of the, those joining us are Canadians and they understand. Um, but uh, our ring tails over here are going to weigh a little bit less. They're a little bit smaller, but we also have mouse lemurs here who weigh only a fraction of that. So it really depends. Now, when it comes to, you can see the blue eyed black lemurs are ready to come out now. We'll see them in just a minute. Um, but when it comes to how um, long they live, that also depends on the species. So if you're looking at a cockerel shafak, they tend to live maybe until their teens in the wild. That'd be a really nice old age. Here they can live into their 20s because, I mean, Grayson's coming out here every day, bringing them the perfect meal. They have a nice fenced-in safe area where nobody messes with them. They get the care of two full-time veterinarians year-round. So they're a little bit spoiled here and tend to live quite a bit longer. Uh, the longest we've ever had a lemur here, the oldest lemur we've ever had, was a red ruff lemur that lived to the age of 37. So they can live quite a long time here. But in the wild, most lemurs, like the cockerel shafak that are awake during the day and about the same size, or the ring-tailed lemurs, they're going to live into maybe their teens. Um, if you look at something like a mouse lemur, they're going to live a lot shorter. So they're going to live maybe five or six years in the wild, if that, and they can live 10 to 12 years here. That is, that is really interesting to get a little insight into, you know, how long they live and why they live as long as they do, especially being in the center. So we've got questions coming in from the group that has joined us. Um, we've got uh, Miss Erickson's class from Connecticut, and they have a question. So I'm going to ask on behalf of Miss Erickson, unless she wants to jump in. Um, <laughs> we, uh, what is the sense they use the most? Is it sight, smell, taste, touch, or hearing? Um, so that's the first question. And of course, this is one I'm definitely gonna to have to ask too, and it's a two parts, so I apologize. How many lemurs do you have at the center? I think everyone's seen that one repeatedly asked. So how many oh. lemurs do you have? And then what sense do they use the most? Absolutely, I've been a bad tour guide. I didn't even give you the basics about the Duke Lemur Center. I got distracted by the lemurs. So a little bit it's about- easy. <laughs> this. Um, So a little bit about the Duke Lemur Center. So we've been here since 1966, over 50 years. And um, we have 15 different species. We actually have mostly lemurs, and we also have another small primate uh, bush baby species, Maholi bush babies, who are extra cute, uh, but they're nocturnal, so not as easy to see. Um, and we have about 210 to 220 individuals. It fluctuates with births and with lemurs going to live at other zoos or coming in to live here. Um, and the other question about their scents that they use the most, lemurs are very well known for being scent communicators. So they use their olfactory system or their scent communication, their sense of smell the most out of any of their senses because it's really important for them to communicate. So I'm actually going to pop over to Gabe and see if we can see the scent gland he has on his neck if he looks the right way. If you look at handsome Gabe right here, right under his neck his fur is a little thinner, it's a little more patchy and you can kind of see his skin a little bit better. So that is where he has a, a scent gland. And a scent gland is kind of, for lack of a better term, it's kind of like our armpit, where things secrete and excrete there whether we want them to or not. So lemurs will have secretions from their scent glands that smell very specifically like them. And so Gabe's scent gland on his neck only smells like Gabe. So when he wants to make sure that somebody knows he's in his territory, he will take that neck and he will rub it against a tree. Lemurs also have scent glands under their tails. But Lupicina over there, she doesn't have the scent gland on her chest. So it depends between the boys and the girls where they have their scent glands. The very special, ooh, I think somebody might be scent marking over here. So the very special way that ring-tailed lemurs scent, use scent is one of my favorite things about lemurs. 
So ring-tailed lemurs do have a scent gland under their tail, but males, like Aristides here, they also have scent glands on their wrists. He's got little black spots right on the inside of his elbow. And they also have scent glands on their shoulder. So when Aristides wants to compete with another male, especially to impress a female and flirt with a female, he will pull his tail in front of him. He will rub it with his arms to get that stinky scent on his shoulder and his wrists all over his tail. And then he will actually wave his tail in the female's face. And that tail is smells just like him and it's his way of flirting and seeing if she likes what she smells. And if he's competing with another male, we call it stink biting literally called stink fighting in the literature, which is one of my favorite scientific terms. So the lemurs will actually, the ring-tailed lemurs will face each other. The boys will get their tails nice and stinky. They'll stand up, they'll do this kind of little squealing noise and they will wave their tails at each other and the stinkiest boy wins. So <laughs> just thinking about this like stink fights, that is an amazing term. And I love the fact that it's actually the scientific term. Um, that is so much fun <laughs> uh, to think about how they're doing that. Um, and also one question we, we got from Ms. LaCastro's class, who I believe is from um, Guelph, Ontario. I hope I got that right. That's always a one I sometimes mess up with the name. Um, how high can the bouncing lemurs like Gabe jump? Um, they look like they were getting really far and really, like, really high. Do we know how far and how high they can jump? So they're actually much better at jumping far than they are at jumping high. So I'm gonna walk back over to them. Hopefully nobody's getting vertigo with the travel back and forth. So the cockerel shafak um, are much better at horizontal leaping. They're called vertical leapers and clingers, meaning their bodies stay vertical as they move. You're gonna see a lot of them moving because our blue-eyed black lemurs just came out and mom's hangry, so she's chasing everybody even though she is the smallest lemur besides her baby in this enclosure. Um, Me and mom so, can relate. They get the same way when I'm hangry. Exactly, exactly. I understand. Um, but these guys are vertical leapers and clingers because like Gabe up there, he's staying upright as he hops and moves through the trees and watches out for hangry mom. But then when they leap, they actually leap better horizontally through the tree. So they can leap up to 20, there's even been a measurement that they could go up to 30 feet in a single bound horizontally. That's a really long jump, but that's even from standing. They can do, I've seen them do a good 10, 15 feet just from standing, not even having to get a jumping start through the trees. In terms of how high they can leap in a single jump, I'd say that's more around seven or eight feet. Not saying that's not impressive, but it's not quite as far. They're much better adapted to leaping horizontally through the trees versus leaping up from the ground. And I'm actually going to come over here because we have the star of the show finally joining us. So there's dad, Quinn. Now it's really easy to tell blue-eyed black lemurs apart because males are black and females are orange, but they both have bright blue eyes. So you can see right here we have mom who is orange. This is Lee and that's her baby Brady. And he's riding just like I told you. He's riding kind of curled up underneath her. You notice he just stole a leaf as she was walking around, he's testing it to see if he likes it. He probably stole some of her breakfast too. Here's a good view of him. It's my favorite thing to watch moms move around because as she runs around, you can just see his little head and his big eyeballs taking it all in as she runs through the forest. He just clings nice and tight and he just holds on for dear life as she moves. Uh, it's actually something you see in all primates as babies. If you guys have ever been around a newborn baby and you put your finger up, they cling really tightly. And they have a really, really strong grip when they're newborns, human newborns. But as we get older, we don't have to cling to mom every day to survive, so our fingers don't stay as strong. But this little baby has been clinging on to mom since day one, so his fingers and toes are holding on nicely. And lemurs have what's called semi-opposable thumbs. So not fully opposable like ours, don't go fully the opposite direction. They can't touch each finger to their thumb individually and do that really small motion, but they can grab things really well. So think of it kind of like when we have an oven mitt on, your thumb might be freed up, you can grab onto something, but you can't pick up something really tiny and manipulate it. So he can cling really, really well, and that's with his hands and his feet. I know we've probably got questions about babies. <laughs> well, we've got a couple questions about babies. You've also got just got questions in general, which is really fantastic. There's People are so, everyone is so curious. We've got a great group of students joining us too from a YouTube Live. I think we've got a second grade class um, joining in from a few places, from one place. We've got Virginia Beach and Albany and Toronto. So 
there's some great schools get Keswick, Ontario. So a lot of people are watching. So it's a really good audience, a really good crowd and very good questions. Everyone really wants to know, you know, how long do the babies stay with their mothers, especially in particular the blue eyed uh, lemurs? How long will that little baby stay clung to its mother? So that's a great question. I'm just moving to get a better perspective of him trying celery from the cockerel shepox bowl. Um, so that really depends not only on the species, but the individual. Lee here, the mom actually has a unique story. Her mom was, I would say, high strung. Um, she was a bit of a stressed out mom. And um, her mom decided that at four months, I think actually less than four months old, quite, quite early on, she did not want to have Lee. She actually wound up um, causing some physical injury to Lee that our vets had to help out with. But Lee here is a wonderful mom who has been doing great with Brady and has not shown any signs of wanting to kick him out early. I will point out that lemurs are not like people. We do not see lemurs staying in touch, going home for the holidays or anything like that. As wild animals, lemurs are going to hit a certain age where it's time to move out and they don't come back to visit mom and dad. And that age usually coincides with their maturity into adulthood. And that means when they hit the age that they can breed and have babies of their own. Now, sometimes they'll stay a little bit past that, but once they hit that age, their hormones, the chemicals in their body will naturally start kicking in to make them think, you know what, maybe I should be in charge, especially with the girls. And they start challenging mom to say, maybe I should be in charge. And mom starts saying, I don't think so. And we start seeing those behaviors and that's usually when it's about time for them to move out. And in the wild, that's when mom would usually kind of chase the babies out. It can, it can look really mean to humans because we can't imagine doing that to our own children, or maybe hopefully most of us can't. But these guys are very different. Once the babies hit those age, it's time for mom to kick them out because she's got to spend her resources having another baby and raising that baby successfully. So in blue-eyed black lemurs, you're usually not going to see a family that's bigger than more than like four or five, mom, dad, and two or three offspring. And then once they hit one, two, three years old, that's usually around the time when they'll move out and they will find another lemur probably around the same age who got kicked out, find another lemur, and they'll start their own family troop, and then they'll start their own family. Uh, Brady here is not even two months old yet, so he doesn't have to worry about any of that anytime soon. Um, we like to joke that the babies have what we call the baby card. So normally, if he were a one-year-old male, mom would not let him eat out of the same bowl as him. That would not be okay. But he's only a couple months old. He's still learning everything, so he gets to steal food from mom's bowl, whereas dad Quinn over here is staying nice and far away from mom, not bothering her, not trying to steal any of her food because he knows his place in this family. He knows mom's in charge and he has better luck maybe trying to steal some of the Shafak food over here from the ringtail. That is super interesting to hear about, you know, what family life is like for the lemurs. So I wonder, is there a big part of their family life that ties into sound? We've had a couple questions uh, come in about what they sound like. Uh, is there any chance that we might be able to hear some sounds um, or are they kind of quiet um, while they're eating and focused? They're pretty quiet while they're eating. And actually you're seeing some scent marking right here. I want to point that out. He's rubbing his oh, hands. Yeah. Quinn is rubbing his hands. He has scent glands on his hands. So he's marking right there. And you'll notice he came over to mom, but he's still sitting facing away from her, trying not to be too obtrusive. Um, so he's still staying a little away. I have heard Lee do a couple of noises. Honestly, these guys sound like little pigs. Um, so she's done some grunting. I'll see if I'll hold it here for a moment and stop talking and see if he does it. Of course, now that I'm here, she's not. Well, that also, we have a couple of people asking about how humans and lemurs interact. It looks like Lee's pretty chill with you being in there and kind of checking out while she's eating. Um, is, you know, what would be the interaction with a lemur and a human maybe outside of the park or outside of the center, but even inside the center? What do you have to take into consideration and, you know, being polite around the lemurs? Absolutely. So, um, there's a lot to answer with this, so I'll try to keep myself on track and not go too long. But um, interactions with humans and lemurs is a really important subject, especially because for lemurs like the ring-tailed lemur, um, the pet trade can be a real threat to them, um, both in the wild and in the United States. Um, now, just because these guys are being pretty chill about me coming up, me putting a camera right near them, all of that, um, that doesn't mean that I interact with them the same way that I would say a dog or a cat that I have at home. These guys are still wild animals. They're definitely not domesticated, not an animal you want to have in your home. 
So don't be fooled by how docile they seem right now. Um, in fact, blue-eyed black lemurs are a great example because this is one of only two families of blue-eyed black lemurs we have here that we can put out in the forest. All of our other blue-eyed black lemur pairs, I think we have three or four of them. Um, we actually don't put them out in the forest because a lot of them have aggression issues. A lot of them get a little territorial with people around their space. Most of our lemurs do not. Most of our lemurs don't mind us coming up here because we handle our lemurs in a very specific way. And that is, we don't handle them at all if we can help it. We let the lemurs do their lemur thing. We come out, you saw Grayson giving them their food. They hopped around her, but they didn't directly interact with her because since they're wild animals, we don't want to have a super close relationship because two things would happen if we tried to have a super close relationship. They would either think that we were lemurs or they would think that they were people and we wouldn't make very good lemurs and they wouldn't make very good people. And everybody would get confused about the rules and how to behave and how to act. And so the way that we keep our relationships with our lemurs so calm and so trusting is by making sure we leave them alone to do their own thing. The only touching we ever do with our lemurs here is if it's absolutely necessary for a veterinary reason, or if we do it as part of a training process where we offer them lots of treats and rewards. And as they're comfortable with it, we might be able to do things like touch their tail or touch another part of their body to check and see something. But that kind of training is only possible with certain lemurs. And it's always as an exchange for a treat. Uh, we have another animal joining us I want to point out. So we are in the woods in North Carolina and squirrels love a free ride. So we've got a squirrel going in to steal some of the food um, so that's, that's the basics of how we interact with our lemurs um, and why they're so calm around us. But I will say, you're only going to see calm lemurs out in the forest because we only have animals out here that we know aren't going to be grumpy at us since we don't have anything in between them. No, that, that makes sense to know that, you know, kind of uh, the group that will play the nicest with each other and interact with you all. Um, so that actually prompts a couple questions, um, given that they are, you know, not in the wild, but they're in the center right now. And you had mentioned that some of the lemurs stay above ground and some come down. Do they do that because they're trying to avoid predators? And do they have natural predators um, in the wild that, you know, determine some of their behavior? Absolutely. So um, I will note one big change we see between our lemurs and lemurs living wildly in Madagascar is that our lemurs tend to spend a little more time on the ground. They're more comfortable there because there are no predators for them to worry about in these forests. Um, and actually in just a moment, I'll explain how we know that there's no predators in this forest and how we know the lemurs aren't just going to go roaming around Durham, North Carolina. So we have very special fencing to keep them in and keep the predators out. Um, things like coyotes or bobcats would not be able to get in here. In the wild in Madagascar, there's a predator called the fusa, and it's one of my, I really love carnivores, so it's one of my favorite animals. And it's not directly related to anything super familiar, but its family is most closely related to like the mongoose family. And it's kind of the size of a large cat, maybe a little larger than a bobcat, maybe a little smaller. And that is an animal that is able to climb into the trees, even to go after lemurs. So that's a very good lemur predator. Um, but of course, on the ground, lemurs are going to be the most vulnerable. So that's absolutely why they don't spend as much time on the ground and why they spend more time up in the trees. They are most vulnerable when they come down. Um, but our lemurs here have learned that the ground isn't scary. In fact, the ground is often where lots of good bits of food get dropped. So they spend a lot more time on the ground than their wild relatives. It's really interesting to hear that they feel a little more comfortable where they are with you all. Um, so they'll venture down to the ground. It's interesting to look into how behavior changes based on where you are and how you adapt. Um, and thinking of that and that adaptations, given that, you know, Madagascar is a small island, how many species of lemurs are there that have adapted to live in different places um, or together on the island? So there is a little bit of debate between scientists over this. So if you talk to someone who focuses on extinct lemurs and focuses on the bones and the morphology, basically how the lemurs are put together, how they've evolved, they'd probably say there were fewer species. But if you talk to someone who's a geneticist and their entire goal is to study the DNA and look at those little differences, they'd say there were more species. So we say that there's about 100 species of lemur living in Madagascar today. Um, and again, those range in size from two inches long to about three feet tall, as tall as maybe some of the people joining us today or their family members. So there's a really big variety and those lemurs can be like the blue eyed black lemur and live in a tiny part of the island eating fruits and vegetables and sometimes even bugs. 
or they can be like the ring-tailed lemur living in a spiny desert that's a really dry climate with lots of big spines um or the cockerel shafak who i've honestly lost track of there we go up there in the tree curled up i don't know if you can even see them curled up up there but those lemurs live on the west coast in deciduous forest and deciduous is a great vocab word deciduous just means that the leaves fall off the trees when the seasons change so we are in a deciduous forest right now in north carolina and that's where those cockerel shafak would live in madagascar madagascar is huge it is about the size of the eastern coast of the United States, it would be about the top of Florida to the bottom of Maine if you put Madagascar over top of the U.S. So it's a huge island. So there's lots of room to adapt to little areas. Oh, he's being really cute. Let's focus in on that. <laughs> and you can see really, he's munching on really, some food. Sorry, I didn't mean to bounce over you. Uh, that's really interesting to think about how big Madagascar is because it's so far away to understand its size. So thank you for that comparison too. Mm -hmm. Look at that, that little family just <laughs> eating away. And I have to say that question about how many lemur species came from Sophie. So it was a really good question. Really glad to have students, you know, checking in from all over North America, it looks like. We've got some students with us here from classrooms in Connecticut and Ontario and Madison, Wisconsin and Guelph. So we've got quite a few students joining in. So again, keep those questions coming. They're really, really fantastic and getting us some great insight as we watch this family of lemurs do their thing. Look, mom is really happy. She's letting a uh, is that dad that's joining in that's eating know. with them now? I was about to say, I'm pretty surprised that dad is able to join, but you notice he took his time coming over here, kind of testing the waters to see how she felt about it. So I'm guessing that since they're eating the chow, all the good bits of the food are left, so she's not feeling all that hangry anymore. She's got a lot of food in her belly now. <laughs> that's really great behavior that we all get to see. Uh, we have one question that I want to ask that came in from uh, Three, Oaks Elm, uh, Three Oaks Elementary. Uh, and are there specific diseases that lemurs are prone to in the wild or in captivity? Is there, you know, is there something that, you know, we should all think about when it may be, you know, interacting with wild animals or in general, but I guess more specific to lemurs too. Is there something that they are particularly prone to, whether they're there with you or in the wild? Um, so that's a great question. And actually to help answer it, I'm going to flip back to meter to make sure everyone has seen what I'm doing right now. So I am wearing a mask right now. All of the staff members here at the Lemur Center are, and there's two reasons for that. Uh, one is we work with other humans and we wanna be extra careful right now with COVID-19 to make sure that we're not putting anybody else at risk of um, contracting anything if we're carrying it. The other reason is that there is some evidence that has come out to suggest that old world primates, so that's really old primates who evolved a long time ago, like lemurs. Lemurs came into the world somewhere between 50 and 60 million years ago. And so these guys are potentially susceptible to contracting COVID-19. We don't need that to be confirmed for us to go ahead and take all of our precautions and wear our masks and make sure that we're nice and safe. The good thing about working with lemurs as opposed to say working with chimpanzees or apes that are in the same kind of family of primates that we are as humans is they're really far removed from us on the primate family tree. So we don't share as many genetics it's still a whole lot of genetics in the grand scheme of things, but when we're splitting hairs, we're pretty far apart from them. And so they can't contract a lot of human diseases that you have to worry about with chimps or gorillas, but we still are very careful when we're interacting with the lemurs. We always handle gloves when we're handling anything that they're going to be eating, whether it's prepping it in the kitchen or bringing it out here into the woods. We uh, always change into clothes that stay here at the Duke Lemur Center. So everything I'm wearing right now, my shoes, my shirt, my pants, they all stay here at the Lemur Center and are washed here at the Lemur Center. And then when I go home, I change into my own clothes to go home. So we're careful in that regard, but mostly lemurs could contract and transfer things that we kind of consider um, intestinal issues. So they can get parasites being out here in the woods, um, they also sometimes like to eat bugs, which tend to sometimes carry worms or other things like that. But that's why we have those two full-time veterinarians on hand to help them out. I'd say one of the bigger things that people would be familiar with is something like salmonella, which most of us know is something you can get from eating raw egg or from eating cookie dough. Um, salmonella is something that can be carried by wildlife out here. And something like that squirrel down there, if a lemur comes into contact with, I don't know, something that a squirrel happened to urinate or defecate on, there is a chance that they could contract something. That's why our vets are very careful. But 
I'm not well versed on diseases in wild lemurs, so I don't have a very good answer for that. And maybe that's something we could talk about on a future virtual talk. Well, it sounds like we're getting you know, queued up for more conversations. We'll have to you know do that <laughs> with another one. Um, we have one question from Miss LeCastro's class as well. So are lemur, lemurs an endangered species? Or are some lemurs, because you said there's how many different species, a uh, hundred or so? So are some endangered? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, oh, we've got some nursing behavior and I really want to make sure oh. you see that before I answer the question. So you can see he's nestled in tight and he's got his eyes closed. So he is still nursing from mom. So he's getting milk from mom so that he can make sure he gets all his nutrients. Um, and so answering the question, which was, Oh, the, sorry, the question was, are uh, lemurs an endangered species? Yeah. And I guess because there's a hundred or so species, are some almost uh, endangered? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for reminding me. So um, yes, no, lemurs, totally get it. <laughs> um, lemurs as a group are considered the most endangered mammals on the planet. In fact, they're considered the most endangered vertebrates on the planet. So that's any animal with a spine. Um, so that's a lot of animals, but that's because all 100 species of lemur are living on that island in Madagascar and that island has severe conservation issues threatening it. Um, and if you'd like to know more about that, I highly recommend you check out a couple of our uh, streams we've done already, especially the one with Dr. James Herrera, who does our conservation work. Um, oh, the Shafak have taken their food back. Um, but the species of lemur individually, they vary in how endangered they are. Um, so if you look at the blue-eyed black lemur, Lee over there, she is critically endangered. And there's also very few blue-eyed black lemurs living in the United States and in North America because we have a very small breeding program for them. So Lee is one of very few blue-eyed black lemur moms that we have in the United States. And the reason she has a baby here is that that provides what we call a genetic safety net. So we can have a healthy population of blue-eyed black lemurs here. But even when you look here, there's very few of them living here. But if you look at the ring-tailed lemurs who have moved on, but we'll just pretend we're looking at them. Um, the ring-tailed lemurs are very popular. There's about 3,000 of them in North America alone. They have a very strong breeding program, lots and lots of genetic safety net for them. But in the wild, they're considered endangered. So don't be fooled if you see lots of them in zoos. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's space for them in the wild. And I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead to answer a question that might be coming which is if there are so many lemurs here in the United States, why don't we put them back in the wild? Why don't we fix the problem that way? And unfortunately, that not only wouldn't fix the problem, it would probably make it worse because every area, every habitat can only handle so many lemurs because there's only so much food to go around. There's only so much space to go around. There's only so many places to sleep to go around. And so the problem in Madagascar is the habitat is disappearing. There's not enough space and not enough food for the lemurs. So what we do is we work in Madagascar to try to make more space, save more habitat, make more resources available for the lemurs there. And then maybe years, decades from now, maybe we could look at reintroducing some more lemurs. But right now, if we took all of our lemurs here and put them back in Madagascar, all they do is eat everybody's food and push other lemurs out of their territory. So unfortunately, it's not very simple. So it sounds like you're not, you know, you don't want to take them back into the wild because we don't want to start any, you know, fights between lemurs. So we got to <laughs> keep everybody yes. with enough food and space to be happy and healthy and live mm -hmm. together. So we've got about a minute or so left. And I've got one last question, I think, that's coming in. And what can we do to help with what you're doing at the Lemur Center and to help take care of lemurs in general from wherever we are, whether it's in Ontario or Connecticut um, or Wisconsin or Virginia Beach? Um, what can we do to help take care of them? Well, of course, I love that question. I'd be happy to answer it. Um, so there are definitely a few different things you can think about. One thing is to just learn more about what's going on with lemurs. And as I mentioned earlier, we did a great talk a few weeks ago with Dr. James Herrera that is uh, archived on the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants YouTube channel that can teach you a little bit more. Um, another thing is if you're able and want to consider it, all of our conservation work we've been doing in Madagascar for almost 30 years is entirely funded by donations and grants. So if you want to learn more, you can visit our website. You can see if you might be interested in donating. And then there are other really simple actions you might be able to take as a consumer when you're looking at what you purchase can impact what happens out in the wild in other areas. A great example of that in Madagascar is rosewood. Rosewood is a type of wood that is very, very high demand. It's a very pretty wood. 
but it takes a very, very long time to grow. It's a really nice hardwood, and that means that the trees take decades longer than other trees to grow. And so if people choose not to purchase rosewood and purchase other more sustainable options, that can decrease the demand. Rosewood is a bit like ivory in Madagascar. It's extremely valuable and it is taken illegally from forests. And so if we're purchasing things like that, we're increasing the demand for something like rosewood. And there's lots of other great examples in James's talk too. I mute myself. Sounds like we've got some great tips, which are just think about where we get things from and what we purchase and where, where you know, how they affect the world around us, which I think applies to everything, not just um, lemurs in Madagascar, but, uh, you know, all the things that we buy and interact with. So looks like we're about wrapping up with our time as <laughs> we see Gabe bouncing away. I feel like he realized it was time to yeah, say goodbye. Was, so, um, <laughs> Let's let's everyone thank Megan and the Duke Lemur Center for sharing their time with us this morning, telling us about their great their great lemurs and a little bit about Madagascar and the work that they're doing. So thank you everyone for joining us. It's been a really really great uh, day, great event with everyone, and thank you for all the classrooms that joined across North America. Uh, there'll be more exploring by the seat of your pants soon. So keep. Keep, keep an eye out and uh, thank you all again. Megan, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us a great tour. Absolutely, thank you everybody. And feel free to check us out on Facebook or our website if you wanna learn more about lemurs. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye everyone, thank you again. Bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you.